Um, welcome, friends, to the fourth webinar of the International Menopause Society, which is being held today. Uh, I bring you greetings from Professor Rod Baber, who's not been able to join us, and uh, from the board of the International Menopause Society. Today, we would be covering the subject of the sexual dysfunction which occurs at midlife. And this is something which we are going to uh, uh, dem I mean, um, have a, two of our speakers. One is from the West, that is Professor Susan Davis, and one is from the East of the world, and that's Professor Sunila, um, uh, Sunila Khandelwal. Now, uh, we also have uh, members, delegates on the web, and uh, we welcome you all. And we have about five cities in the country, in India, where they have uh, uh, gotten a lot of our members who are members of the Indian Menopause Society, who have downloaded, the, who are downloading the program and listening to all of us speak. So welcome to all of you too. And I will welcome the uh, moderators of these five cities, Dr. Ratnavali Chakravati from Kolkata, Dr. Anju Soni from Jaipur, Dr. Sudha Sharma from Jammu, Dr. Pramila Modi from Patna, and Dr. Ambucha Churanur from Hyderabad. And of course, welcome to all of you delegates who are online, and we are happy to be here with you. Now, we all know that there are certain facts about sexual problems, and they are reported in almost 25 to 63 percent of women worldwide, with the prevalence increasing in postmenopausal women which is even higher between 68 to 86%. The reason we have selected this topic today is because it's a topic which normally neither the healthcare workers discuss nor do women discuss. And it is important for us to understand how to deal with these problems, how to question our patients, how to get the information from them. We know that it is associated with a lower quality of life and we want to get them to have a better quality of life. Only 21% of women are known to be having a persistent sexual, though having persistent sexual problems, will only that many discuss it with their um, doctors. Now, it is unfortunately the most underreported, undertreated disorder for women at midlife. Now, WHO defines sexual health as a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well being in relationship to sexuality. It is not merely the absence of disease, dysfunction, or infirmary. Sexual health requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences, free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. The focus is not just on physical sexual function, that are the genitals working, or whether the individual can be fulfilled and satisfied in their physical, emotional, and social experience with sex. We today have with us Professor Susan Davis, who is an M NHMRC Principal Research Fellow, 2007, Director of Monash University Women's Health Research Program 2000, since 2005. She's a consultant endocrinologist and head specialist women's health clinic for women with complex disease, Alfred Hospital, Melbourne, 2011, and consultant at Cabrini Medical Center. Professor Susan Davis is a past president of the Australasian Menopause Society and president-elect of the International Menopause Society. Professor Davis's research has advanced the understanding of estrogen and testosterone action, deficiency and replacement in women, and has over 330 peer-reviewed publications. She has received a number of prestigious awards and was recently recognized for her contributions in endocrinology by the International Excellence in Endocrinology Laureate Award of the Endocrine Society USA for 2015. Congratulations, Professor Susan, and I now invite her to speak to us after I have introduced our next speaker, who's Professor Sunila Khandelwal, Secretary General of the 
Council of Accredited Menopause Societies of the International Menopause Society. She's a past president of the Indian Menopause Society and represented, rep representing the Indian Menopause Society today to the Asia Pacific Menopause Federation. She's a senior consultant gynecologist director, Midlife Women Healthcare and Menopause Center at the Fortis or Scott Hospitals in Jaipur, India. She has worked as a medical superintendent, professor and head OBGYN at Mahatma Gandhi University of Medical Science and Technology and at SMS Medical College, Jaipur, India. She has done pioneering work in the field of menopausal healthcare and received various international and national awards. Lectured widely in both in all parts of the world and she has published several scientific papers and is the founder editor of the Journal of Midlife Health. Dr. Sunila strives to do extensive, effective networking worldwide by her clinical research and organizational skills with esteemed organizations like IMS, BMS, NANS, APMF, and SEPOS for exchanging experiences and expanding the influence of IMS globally. So I'll first of all request, um, and I'll tell uh, all of you on how we are going to proceed with this program. When we speakers are speaking, the delegates on the web could directly ask questions while the session is live by just adding their name and email ID where the question and answer tab is below the video box throughout the event. They need to type in their name, email ID, write the question and click submit. The questions will be received by me and the questions will be answered at the end of the session which will be for the last 40 to 45 minutes of this two hour program. For the people who are sitting in the audiences in the five centers in India, please write your questions on a piece of paper and hand it over to the moderator who will then ask the questions to the speakers towards the end of the session. So I'll first of all invite Professor Susan Davis to give her talk on hormones and declining libido. Professor Susan, please. Thank you. Now, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to go through to the share. You can hear me clearly? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. I've just gone to share screen. So you can see this now? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you all about the issue of hormones and declining libido. Firstly, I would like to disclose that I do receive some research grant support from Lawley Pharmaceuticals and um, honoraria from Abbott and Pfizer. So what I would like to do is review the impact of female sexual dysfunction, talk a little bit about the confusion with the classification of female sexual dysfunction, then how hormones might impact female sexual well-being, and a little bit about hormones for treatment. Firstly, why do we actually care? Now, um, Dr. Shah has already pointed out that sexual health is the right of every woman. These seem to be advancing, so I'll just control them a bit. We care because women care about their sexual well-being. This is a global study that involved 29 countries and nearly 30,000 women and men aged 40 to 80. And you can see that... Um, there were real, this is the data for women, that women really had a lot of issues, both periodic and frequent issues for lack of sexual interest, inability to have an orgasm, difficulties with lubrication, and really importantly, the high frequency of no pleasure during intercourse and pain during intercourse. Now this is um, probably an underestimate of this. Now that, if you, we lost those slides. Okay. Women do continue to be sexually active, um, even if they're unhappy with their sexual function. Now, this is a study we did in Australia, looking at pre and post menopausal women and the frequency of sexual events per month amongst women who are sexually satisfied and dissatisfied. If you look in the very light blue color, this is postmenopausal women 
who are not happy about their sexual activity, but they still have on average sexual activity five times a month. So women do this to satisfy their partner, to keep harmony in the relationship, even though they're not enjoying the sexual activity. And what we also know is that postmenopausal women who are dissatisfied with their sexual well-being, they're still sexually active, but they have lower total well-being. So this is evidence that sexual dysfunction really impacts on quality of life. Now, there are two class major international classifications of female sexual dysfunction. Many will have heard, you have heard of the Di Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health, or DSS DSMM. And this is internationally used to classify psychiatric disorders. There was a new evaluation of female sexual dysfunction and classification in the latest update, the DSM-5. The problem is that this is very rigid, this classification. And women need to have a problem at least 75% of the time for it to be considered a problem, which is a very arbitrary amount. I mean, at what point does a problem become a real problem for women? Is this 50%, 60%? 75%, we actually have no idea. So there is a lot of disagreement about this classification. There's a WHO classification that was developed in 1992. It's very out of date and it's currently being updated. And for each of these classifications, they're not evidence-based, they're purely expert opinion. The International Society of Sexual Medicine went through a very detailed process over the last two years and this year have published a new, class, a new consensus on female sexual dysfunction. So importantly, hypoactive sexual desire disorder has been relabeled hypoactive sexual desire dysfunction or low libido. And they've retained separate entities of female sexual arousal dysfunction, orgasmic dysfunction. They've included genital pain dysfunction. Um, they've added in a postcortical syndrome, syndrome. And this is when women feel guilty or have negative emotions after having sex. Low pleasure with orgasm and painful orgasm which as you know, as gynecologists, some women will complain about. Now I'm going to mostly talk about low desire causing distress because this is the most common problem. This and other sexual problems can be lifelong. They can be acquired. And when you take a history, you need to work out, is it situational? I'm just not interested in my partner. Or is it generalized? I have absolutely no sexual thoughts, no interest in sex whatsoever. These are important things to elicit. If the problem's lifelong, hormones are not going to help. If it's lifelong, the woman most likely needs sexual counseling and it may well be related to issues like abuse, etc. So moving on to the hormones, this is a very um, simplistic diagram outlining the hormones that may impact sexual function. And um, I'll go through each of them in brief, but you can see that importantly, the sex steroids seem to have a major role. We really don't understand the role of neurotransmitters in this whole black box of the brain because it's impossible to do detailed studies in humans looking at, at, at what's happening in hormones in the brain and neurotransmitters. So firstly, estrogen. Most of the studies of naturally menopausal women looking at estrogen in sexual function give very mixed outcomes. Studies of surgical menopause are confounded by why the women actually had their surgery, the type of surgical procedure performed, and the accompanying androgen deficiency when the ovaries are removed. 
So when we look at the role of estrogens and female sexual dysfunction, there, there are a lot of limitations of current research. So really we don't actually understand from human studies exactly what the role of endogenous estrogen in, is in human function. But when we look at using estrogen and treating low libido, estrogen does not necessarily, um, in most studies, actually improve sexual dysfunction after menopause. However, systemic estrogen therefore should not be used to treat vaginal atrophy or female sexual dysfunction. And this is the international consensus recommendation. Oral estrogen therapy will increase sex hormone binding globulin, may lower its free testosterone, and may actually work and worsen female sexual dysfunction in some women. Now, I'm not talking here about vulvovaginal atrophy as a treatment, you know, estrogen being used for that, because I'm leaving that to Professor Sanilla. So, systemic estrogen therapy is not a treatment for se female sexual dysfunction. What about progesterone? In many countries, um, women are prescribed progesterone after menopause and are told that progesterone is the missing menopausal hormone. So we do know that during the luteal phase, sexual desire is in fact lower, and, this is a, and the lowering of sexual desire is associated with progesterone level. And progesterone therapy does not improve female sexual dysfunction and cannot be recommended for this. Oxytocin is often um, espoused as a, a forgotten hormone that should be used to treat female sexual dysfunction and as the hormone of love and sexuality. Now there is a lot of um, evidence to suggest that oxytocin has a role in what we call affiliative behaviour. So um, compassion, empathy, connectivity. It's also been implicated as being important for sexual responsiveness and arousal, but in fact this has not been borne out in the very limited data we have. So what we, the available data, what we know today, does not support using oxytocin to actually improve female sexual function. It's not an established therapy. Prolactin has been implicated as, as causing dysfunction. So women with hyperprolactinemia um, commonly become um, amenorrheic, they have low estradiol, they have low testosterone. And in fact, treating hyperprolactinemia may improve female dysfunction, but the data to truly support this is limited. What we can recommend is that if a woman is premenopausal, has amenorrhea or galactorrhea that's not explained by anything else, prolactin should be measured and hyperprolactinemia should be treated. But you can't say to such women and your sexual function will improve. Finally, let's move on to androgens. So this slide shows you that, sex that, that all the androgens decline with age. So the decline in testosterone you see here, a linear fall in DHEA and DHA sulfate, a decline in free testosterone and a decline in androstein dione. The steepest decline in all of these is during the pre-menopausal years. And none of these fall acutely with natural menopause. We know that low androgen levels are associated with low sexual desire and low arousal in women. This has been shown in several studies. One study that we did, um, a study from SWAN, and this is a study from um, Denmark. So I just want to walk you through the logistics of this. As you know, androgens are produced by the adrenals and the ovaries in premenopausal women. If the ovaries become dysfunctional or a woman goes through surgical menopause, approximately 50% of her androgen production is lost. If a woman has adrenal insufficiency, now this could be something like Addison's disease, but this also can arise simply by giving a woman um, 
glucocorticosteroids. So a woman with rheumatoid arthritis on chronic glucocorticosteroids, a woman who has severe asthma who has glucocorticosteroids, prednisolone, these women will have 50% reduction in their androgen. And then if you woman, have a woman who's got panhyperpituitism, so that you don't have ovarian or adrenal function, you get complete suppression of androgen production. And such women are profoundly androgen deficient. Now, we in other groups have shown that testosterone replacement for low desire will significantly improve desire, um, as well as se sexual satisfaction, arousal, pleasure, and orgasm frequency in women with a whole range of disorders, not just naturally menopausal women, but also surgically postmenopausal women, postmenopausal women on no concurrent hormone therapy, premenopausal women, but importantly, premenopausal women taking SSRIs and SNRIs who have FSD. There is a trend and promoted in the internet that DHEA may be an alternative to testosterone. So the big systematic reviews done in the last couple of years, one published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, showed no improvement in any of these parameters or in sexual dysfunction. A recent Cochrane review showed a minimal effect on desire only but that effect was not considered to be clinically meaningful. So no one recommends DHEA for treatment of female sexual dysfunction in peri or postmenopausal women. You may well then ask, well, what about women with adrenal insufficiency? And indeed, there is no significant benefit of DHEA therapy on anxiety or sexual well-being in women with adrenal insufficiency, so it cannot be recommended. And I'm just going to run through these briefly. The International Society of Sexual Medicine recommends a trial of transdermal testosterone therapy. Treatment should not be continued between, beyond six months if a woman has no benefit. This approach is limited in countries where there's no testosterone for women. And therefore, although we don't recommend male products be used, sometimes there is no alternative but to use low dose of male products. The Endocrine Society of the US has similar recommendations. I'm not going to go through them all again, but really this is to show you there's an agreement internationally about these guidelines. Importantly, Baseline levels of testosterone do not predict response to therapy. I'd like to suggest which women are least likely to benefit with testosterone. Firstly, young women with normal ovarian function. If their ovarian function is normal, they're making testosterone, there are other issues going in. Women with poor relationships. Now that seems obvious, but sometimes women will ask for testosterone because they think it will fix their relationship. Women with very high sex hormone binding globulin levels who are taking oral estrogen therapy will not benefit. Women with other sexual problems. And as I said, women who have lifelong problems need counselling to sort out that as opposed to testosterone therapy. These are the obvious contraindications. So women with androgen excess, hormone-dependent malignancy, and if a woman has the very low SHBG level, you have to be judicious. And I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions on this section. I can't hear anyone.
question from Patna. I can, can you I can hear, hear now. I can yeah. hear now. Yes, now can you hear me? Okay. Absolutely. There are a few, uh, there are a few questions on your uh, talk. Uh, basically, I wanted to know whether um, when you do any kind of a research on uh, sexual dysfunction, there are various tools which are mentioned in literature. Yes. Which is, the, which is the kind of tool you use in your research? Uh, which is the one you like to use and you find it most practical? So I've, the, the best one to use and the most practical is actually the one developed by Procter & Gamble, the Profile of Female Sexual Function, which unfortunately is not available for general use. Okay. Um, that is what we are going to use in our current and future research because we've, had to, we've been able to obtain permission for this. So I think the next best one is the Female Sexual Function Index. This has some limitations because it, is, it was developed in heterosexual couples. It has questions that depend on intercourse. Mm -hmm. And it also depends on feelings and, 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 and the relationship with the partner. And so it has li limited um, use if, if you have women who perhaps are not in a chronic, you know, stable relationship. Uh, and I think and it's not useful for women in, in same-sex relationships, etc. But the most internationally used is the Female Sexual Function Index. Okay. And, and a distress, they, I'll, I'll just add a distress scale should be included as well. Which one? The female sexual distress scale yeah. by derogatus. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think if anyone would like to do any kind of research on, uh, on sexual dysfunction, these are the tools you could use and you could carry out surveys on uh, your midlife women and get some good Indian data. Yeah. Uh, the other question you yeah. have is... Uh, we'll come to the moderators a little later, please, at the end of the session. Uh, the other question was about, uh, may I request the moderators please not to ask questions now? Um, the other question I have is that when one does a hysterectomy, there are many uh, surgeons who would prophylactically remove the ovaries. And if a woman is uh, postmenopausal, say she is 52, 53, uh, there are many who just remove the ovaries saying that it's no point leaving them behind. What is your opinion on that? Especially so, when sexual dysfunction is concerned. Well, there is good evidence that the postmenopausal ovary continues to produce testosterone. So I think that um, it's... We know that women increasingly continue to be sexually active in their later years and I think that this needs to be discussed with the patient so that they understand that they are that the ovaries are not just dead tissues. So women tend to think that after menopause they've just defunct. But the women need to understand that their ovaries could be still producing important hormones and that these hormones may be contributing to their general and sexual well being. So I think the conversation needs to be had. Yes. So I think that uh, message should go across to most of the clinicians and surgeons that ovaries continue to play some role later on even after the menopause and therefore routine removal of ovaries should not be done unless the patient has been counseled. Uh, there is a mention in literature about subtotal hysterectomies where the cervix is left behind and the uterus is removed. And they say that there is a better, I mean, there's less amount of sexual dysfunction in post-hysterectomized women if the cervix is left behind. Do you have any opinion on that? I'm not aware of any data that really supports that. And in fact, if you look at the data for total hysterectomy um, versus non-hysterectomy, the evidence that with preservation of the ovaries, the evidence that hysterectomy is really adverse is limited because by doing a hysterectomy, you're often alleviating women of, of pain, bleeding, anxiety, you know, a lot of issues. So I don't believe there's any data to support that and it's certainly not going to influence their hormones. Right. And the last question for you, Susan, for me is that if you are um, using uh, estrogen replacement therapy for a woman, and uh, probably it's not going to um, 
help her with her vaginal atrophy or if you find that uh, her libido doesn't improve with the estrogen do you normally combine estrogen and testosterone well i think estrogen therapy we would all agree should be for s- symptoms so if a woman is not having vasomotor symptoms so the classic would be a 62 year old woman she's many years post menopause or she's not having vasomotor symptoms she's not on estrogen i would just treat her with testosterone i don't need to treat her with estrogen as well if she's on estrogen and having low libido i would add in testosterone but you don't need to be on estrogen to have testosterone therapy no i agree with you it's just that probably estrogen alone may not help a woman no um, and, uh, yes so that is the reason i wanted to bring out that yes you could add testosterone to the estrogen in case the yes. woman the low libido in spite of uh, having um, estrogen replacement therapy absolutely yeah so those were a few clinical questions i wanted to discuss with you susan thank you so much and uh, now we request um, uh, dr sunila to give her talk which is on uh, female um, vaginal atrophy and uh, how it affects sexual dysfunction yes sunila thank you duru uh, it has been wonderful to listen to susan and uh, my topic is the most uh, hidden neglected problem in female sexual dysfunction when we are talking about which is uh, which really affecting the sexual quality of life of a woman and learning objectives of today's interactive session is that we are going to just know about little bit about vaginal atrophy and what was the need for neo nomenclature that is geneto urinary syndrome of menopause what is exactly the prevalence i will just highlight few uh, some of the uh, recent surveys which have shown the impact of pva on sexual quality of life understanding the pathophysiology and clinical picture we will just see what are the evidence based assessment tools for us for diagnosis and what is in our basket for the management what what are the newer modalities which are coming and of course the most important thing i would like to share the key recommendations which has been released from international menopause society and what could be the future agenda in terms of research and in terms of medical care so we believe as we all know it affects the uh, sexual functions and quality of life because of declining estrogen and it's a chronic progressive condition and unlike vasomotor symptoms it requires treatment it does not resolve on its own and uh, the severity depends on the, the level of estrogen and ranges from mild to moderate debilitating uh, symptoms which is um, which uh, really cause uh, atrophic vaginitis and sexual difficulties so it is really really important to have awareness recognizing and treating the underlying dba which will improve the health and sexual quality of life of women and beyond menopause in fact many of the women continues to underestimate the impact of eva on quality of life even and the reasons may be multiple and complex but healthcare provider also do not proactively raise and they don't want to open the can of worms which is limited time of uh, deal to deal with the consequences so the subject is avoided both in social conversation and media and as you have rightly said it is under reported under recognized and there is a challenge which uh, because it is under treated too pva uh, affects women's uh, and the couple lives and uh, many women were continue to suffer in silence but uh, so uh, but they were uh, negative connotations related to the term they don't they don't want to use vagina vulva or atrophy so unified approach was adopted and recently the new terminology was given by iss and nams Uh, it is a, it is a comprehensive term that includes symptomatic dva as well as lower urine tract symptoms which affect the quality of life and about 50% of the women they experience these four symptoms to some extent with the lower levels of circulating circulating estrogen after menopause it results in physiologic biological histological and clinical changes because vagina is a surrogate indicator for lower estrogen level in post menopausal women and it's clinically relevant related to age time since menopause sexual activity partners availability and general health uh, of course the most important symptom the vaginal dryness increases significantly with the age 
and in surgical menopause is rightly said because of the the abrupt decline in estrogen there is more uh, these women are more symptomatic but with the use of vaginal estrogen they have shown good results in the uh, in the various parameters of the vaginal mucosa as we all know estrogen is a very important uh, uh, role to play in terms of maintenance of thickness of vaginal uh, uh, mucosa in terms of giving color moisture and rugosity and decrease cause proliferation of the connective tissue fragmentation and hyalinization while uh, it uh, helps in glycogen formation which is a fuel for the duodenal bacilli to prevent pathogens the sex steroids regulate vaginal function and with decrease uh, they also affect the vaginal permeability and decrease cause uh, difficulties in the lubrication so it's a it is a condition which impacts sexual quality of life adequate estrogen uh, uh, helps in receptivity and lubrication while low estrogen uh, causes dyspareunia and sexual pain and these sexual problems um, are uh, related to the estrogen levels in a woman uh, the menopause epidemiology study have shown that female with fsd are four times nearly four times more likely to have vba than women without sexual dysfunction and with this background uh, it was a great step from indian menopause society to release an important document on in 2010 uh, on the uh, occasion of uh, world menopause day which really helped uh, um, women and the medical care professionals across the globe uh, in the, uh, there was an important uh, Uh, documentation which says there is a global variation in attitude of vaginal atrophy various uh, from uh, i have just labeled them according to the years because uk survey european survey revealed survey they all uh, 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 narrated that most of the women they have uh, the vba and the women voices also in 2010 it was released that they nearly 39% had discomfort but never undergone treatment around 63% levi study the same around 45% they reported but they don't they don't um, uh, they are reluctant in taking treatment again the closer study which has which shows that less than half of the us respondents were aware of the available treatments which is very eye opening again the another closer survey from the comparison from northern and southern europe only 28% of women reported using local estrogen therapy the recently in the recent issue of our climatric journal the revised survey european revised survey also showed that nearly 42% were having discomfort but they were reluctant in using different modalities both european and american uh, us revised surveys have detected significant barriers in healthcare professionals management educational programs that prevent correct diagnosis and effective treatment uh, coming to the asia uh, again asian menopause survey already has been uh, we all are aware that majority of women believe that improving the general health may improve their quality of life and because most of the women nearly 40% they suffer from a general pain but they don't come report to doctor and uh, sitting in a ob gynae setting where we are uh, coming uh, day in uh, day in and day out for clinical practice this is an important document which was released from the asian countries that nearly 56% were having the symptoms of vaginal atrophy a country like india again 10 to 40% they have symptoms and the ims research data collection also highlighted in the recent document and but the indian women needs greater awareness uh, of, about for this problem this was a study which was done by meetha and atal which shows that Uh, again most of the women were not comfortable in talking about sexual functions but and the, but it does not it is the functioning is not affected by menopause uh, after menopause and sociodemographic profile and did not impact sexual function this was one of the my study which was uh, related to the symptom clusters and health related quality of life in indian menopausal women in which uh, 
ready women health questionnaire is usually submitted and it shows the urogenital component is very strongly reflected among the problems and mainly 28% of the women they have sexual problems and 41% has uh, vaginal dryness various actions were taken in rural and urban population but there was reluctance in hrt acceptance so all these surveys on vva have shown concluded that the, despite a prevalence and associated burden vva is often inadequately identified addressed in medical practice and there is lack of communication all these surveys which uh, we have narrated so far they were all online interviews without any clinical evaluation and i'm happy to share again recently a article came in the journal of uh, that agata survey which is a multi centric study and they have first time did objective genital evaluation and sur uh, surprisingly more than 90% problems were there in their group so that what should be the approach uh, I, i think we have to have a very proactive approach and pelvic examination to identify pba in addition to the detail interview and questionnaires for assessment Uh, how to uh, how to discuss of course initiate the discussion consider the relationship problems remember if they are using systemic systemic estrogen therapy still they can have vaginal symptoms and we have to be mindful about the urinary symptoms and then we have to, we need to encourage the women to select the therapy which is most comfortable to them uh, the, uh, when the questionnaire uh, discovers or uh, on the symptomatic various symptoms can be seen and the signs on clinical examination justifies the clinical picture but still this is the most important tool that the vaginal health index one can use to assess the vaginal atrophy and with the release of new normal pressure the assessment tool is combining both a vulva and the vaginal atrophies and how to assess them but the recent vaginal atrophy symptom 2 was associated with a better correlation in relation to ph which can be used now uh, vaginal understanding the clinical picture of vaginal atrophy one has to keep in mind the other differential diagnosis related to other reasons for the vva but the basic treatment goal is to provide relief we have in our uh, different options local and systemic menopause hormone therapy in your options non hormonal options vaginal lasers which are recently in vogue and lifestyle changes and sex therapy uh, for the treatment uh, the important documents about the recommendation released in 2012 which says that even the patient is having systemic mhd is still 26% uh, using the uh, hormone systemic therapy is still have urogenital atrophy which is uh, which is uh, And, uh, which is uh, uh, which is not which is not a sufficient reason to justify not recommending systemic hormone therapy in women with vaginal symptoms so topical administration is advocated we have def different preparations but low dose vaginal estriol is most effective we have ce we have ultra low dose vaginal estriol in uh, uh, again and the et surveillance and PHT was not indicated in asymptomatic low risk women receiving low dose vaginal estrogen but creams can be underdosed or overdosed and have poor rates of adherence various preparations we have like cream um, the uh, tablets and rings and recently uh, estradiol vaginal soft gel capsule has been advocated but still the we need to have long term studies and recent complete data various preparations are available in the market but um, the conjugated estrogen have been shown and there is a study which shows uh, uh, they are effective in asian menopausal women and as uh, shown here changes in the ph and the uh, histology the most important concern is use of local estrogen treatment is in the breast and gynecological cancer and but the it's a which is a common result in the treatment of gynecological cancer but low dose vaginal estrogen is found safer than systemic therapy but we have to consult it with our oncology team before prescribing them because they are suffering from pain they have a reason whether irradiation or radical surgery rupectomy so one has to consider the replacement the tsec is the new armamentarium in our basket which is effective in vulvovaginal atrophy and has shown to improve the percentage of cells 
superficial cells and reducing the percentage of basal cells and normalizes TH. I will not go into detail. Uh, Susan has already uh, described the use of intravestrosterone, uh, but of course, uh, just to share, the phase three clinical trial have shown that it has. Um, uh, there is a significant decrease in pH with the use of intravaginal dehydroestrosterone, but larger studies are required before recommend to be uh, in clinical practice. In non-hormonal therapy, we have to avoid risk factors. We have to advocate sexual intercourse or masturbation, which decreases the symptom, and we have we can suggest vaginal dilator and as another option. Uh, but the basic challenge is that we are having over-the-counter prescriptions. So if there is a, there we need to think, we need to think that, that whether these local vaginal estrogen, with view of the safety profiles and other positive benefits, can be made to OTC or not in worldwide. With like vaginal moisturizers, they are hydrophilic, insoluble, cross-linked polymers, and regular use provides symptomatic relief by changes in the vaginal epithelium and promote it for long-term relief of vaginal dryness, but requires two, three applications per week and do not require reapplication before sexual intercourse. The lubricants uh, they are considered temporary measures to relieve the vaginal dryness during intercourse, but the FDA uh, is approved as cosmetics and they have shorter duration of action, must be applied frequently, and sexual aid and condom compatibility is there. So lubricants are temporarily to moisten, while the moisturizers maintain hydration, can last for two, three days, but osmolarity is the basic important factor which, uh, which uh, for the acceptability to avoid irritation. The various uh, lubricants and moisturizers are being available across the world. The emerging op option, osmomorphine, it is recently approved in um, European Medical Agency for the treatment of moderate to severe symptomatic PBA in postmenopausal women who are not candidates for local estrogen therapy. Uh, the less of foxyfen is again uh, shown promising results. Pearl study has shown that there is no increased risk of CA endometrium 5 data, but some increased risk of BT and pulmonary embolism, so it's still it is not a safer drug. In the basket of CAMS treatment, again herbal, as uh, everyone uh, across the world, all the different countries have their own hubs to prove their um, efficacy, but nothing is, it's, it's just a symptomatic relief or maybe uh, not, but uh, there is no enough scientific evidence for their recommendation. Intravaginal application of the isoflavin has also shown some improvement and, uh, and it could be a viable option for women, those who have contraindication to HD for decline of HD. Homeopathy not proven, oxytocin already uh, covered by Susan, that um, it's uh, still questionable. Vitamin E and D have shown some effects. Topical anesthetics, just a temporary relief, and Botox and stem cell therapy is still, is still in, uh, in the air. We don't have enough proof or not, not much in our knowledge. Uh, the laser, the upcoming, the most important second generation vaginal laser thermotherapy is an emerging, effective, minimally invasive, non-surgical, non-ablative RBM treatment for vaginal relaxation syndrome, which is a consequence of vaginal atrophy and uh, it is. Uh, it it really it thickens out the collision and removes the rigosity, removes the laxity. And the erbium laser is superior to carbon dioxide laser. And the Wallace study has uh, uh, shown that uh, potentially it is potentially effective in clinical practice and uh, the treatment, the non-hormonal treatment of GSM. And it is uh, it has a positive effect on vaginal dryness and dyspareunia, and of course VHIS score, and uh, also uh, uh, on the, the the comparative study with the estriol group has again shown a superiority. So it is acceptable as it is ambulatory procedure, walk in and walk out, minimally invasive. Virtually painless, no special pre and post operative care, no consumables, quick procedure and high success rate. But the most important point, patient choice have to be kept in mind in the treatment options. And I'm happy that 
this document was released on world menopause day 2010 which really touched and um, ended the silent suffering across the world in, in the field of medical healthcare professionals also for women awareness and we were happy to share that we have translated the leaflet in hindi and in our local language and all other countries also those who uh, have translated must have shown uh, must have realized the benefit of the answers which were given in this particular leaflet and we have our magazines which has this says detail about it this is very very important the latest one recently the key points were released related to the menopausal hormone therapy in this particular field according to the grades of recommendation that the healthcare providers should be proactive in order to help their patients to disclose the symptoms related to bva and seek adequate treatment when general discomfort is clinically relevant treatment should be started early before if vocable atrophic changes have occurred and needs to be continued to maintain the benefits the principle of the treatment in women with established bva are both restoration of vaginal urogenital physiology and alleviation of symptoms when bva is the sole symptom local estrogen treatment should be the first choice the choice of modality for local estrogen administration should be guided by patient's preference and they should they minimize they have proved minimize the uh systemic absorption and the observed levels not uh, are above normal range of 20 pg per ml uh, the addition of progesterone is not indicated when appropriate low dose local estrogen is used although long term data uh, more than one year are still lacking if estrogen is ineffective or undesired vaginal lubricants and moisturizers can relieve the symptoms due to dryness and sexual activity should be recommended on regular basis there are few data on the use of vaginal estrogens in women with gynecological hormone responsive cancers so they should be used with discretion use of local estrogen in women with tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors need careful counseling and discussion with the patient and oncology team estriol and testosterone preparations may be an option for such patients but more studies are needed so it is imperative that menopause societies and pharma companies should work together with the regulatory regulators to change the labeling of the vaginal estrogen preparation which currently carry precisely the same contraindication as systemic uh, hd even though the local estrogen is not absorbed systematically uh, systemically so there is this is the most important action points for the medical profession uh, there is need for new products the development of new novel efficacious, efficacious safe interventions are essential to expand our armamentarium emerging intervention include safe new laser treatment should be advocated and Uh, we have neglected need of androgenic products which are licensed for female sexual dysfunctions and it is very very important uh, that uh, we have to include bva in our the, in the menopause agenda by encouraging an open sensible conversation on the topic of intimacy and performing a gynecological pelvic examination if indicated so what we know about the women sexual dysfunction is still an iceberg we have to break the ice because nearly 50% of the women suffer from fsd beyond menopause in 50s and only 50% report and less than 50% take the treatment so we need to diagnose and routinely treat the signs and symptoms of bva in uh, to avoid the vicious circle between the sexual pain other uh, and other fsd so there is no reason why menopausal women should not enjoy sexual activity as long as they want to myths and new reality is different she should not think that the sex expiration has date has come the sex with silver lining the beautiful uh, picture here shows it's simply 60 how lovely is that you only live once that one is now grab life run love it or live it what else you want think sex sex as a best meditation and enjoy life with this i just invite you all to the 15th world congress at prague see you at prague and thank you for your kind attention from pink city jaipur india to all my national and international friends thank you so much uh, thank you sunila thank you very much for this very good talk
and um, i have a few questions regarding the use of uh, uh, lubricants and moisturizers as a matter of fact uh, you know there are women who have trouble with uh, a dry vagina and uh, they are uh, you know there there is contraindication to the use of vaginal uh, estrogen probably because they have gone through chemo or radiotherapy and we need to guide them on what they could use in terms of moisturizers or lubricants uh can you uh, can you recommend how a clinician should choose lubricant or moisturizer to recommend to their patients so that they do not suffer any side effects from them themselves do you have any suggestions on that yeah yeah to do it's a very important question i think and uh, uh, because these women those who are looking for alternatives or additional uh, 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 therapies like or useful uh, products like moisturizers and lubricants i think they should uh, be they should choose which is similar to their phy physiology or uh, which is similar to their own vaginal histology or maybe the ph osmolarity and of course the experience the contents of the moisturizer and uh, the lubricants are most important to be chosen because like with methyl paraben they have a cytotoxic effect and some of them which are low in glycol content they can have candidas because of fungal infection so one has to identify whether they are suffering from any you know local infection and the ph osmolarity because who is already um, released uh, the guideline that ph should not go beyond 380 uh, but most of the uh, uh, lubricants available they have like 1100 or more than 1200 and that's the reason they are getting the irritations so i think we the clinician should prescribe a very uh, Uh, identical uh, preparation to the normal vaginal flora and the vaginal pH. Yeah, yeah there is a very nice uh, uh, table which enlists all the moisturizers and lubricants in one of the recent journals of the Climetric, and it gives you idea about the osmolality and the pH. And based on the recommendations of WHO, you are able to decide which ones are safe for your patients. and you could uh, recommend them accordingly but uh, there has also been a question that uh, sometimes uh, you know younger women are using it probably because of uh, uh, you know not because of vaginal atrophy they use moisturizers probably because they don't get lubricated enough and they tend to be using it even when they are trying to conceive so there has been some information regarding uh, you mentioned it sunila about cytotoxicity on the uh, probably on the sperm or uh, or any such harm if a younger woman uses it the one who is wanting to get pregnant yeah i think you are you have rightly pointed out that these are the these are the moisturizers which are being commonly used if if they been uh, the women those who are looking for pregnancy i think they should just abandon this because they have a um, cytotoxic content the most important is methyl paraben as i have already said so uh, i think they should uh, they should uh, the clinician should uh ask them not to use and of course uh the moisturizers uh, they can use in between but not when they are trying for pregnancy or during their fertile days yeah uh, the other question is that when women use vaginal estrogen um there is always a concern that would would it pass on to their male partners so is there any suggestion on when they should use the vaginal estrogen Uh, i think this is a very common questions and the simplest answer one line answer to this question is that yes of course we 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 should always instruct these women to use one hour before the sexual activity and uh, this which is much safer and uh, it will not pass to the male part by the time the peak hormonal levels are already there inside the women and uh, the most of the uh, contents are being absorbed Uh, experience you have in the use of any oral medication 
uh, which has been used for vaginal atrophy and the oral uh, can i uh, can i can you repeat the question please uh, there are medications which are being uh, prescribed for sexual dysfunction uh, uh, as you mentioned about oxycodone yeah we have in market oral dhk and uh, that is 25 um, uh, mg which is available 25 to 75 but i think they have other uh, the studies have shown that they are lo- there are short term um, use is advocated not more than 6 months and uh, this uh, on, and mainly restricted to the premenopausal castrated females and of course in natural menopause those who are not having benefits related to uh estrogens so very limited uh, role but of course we do have and that they have shown efficacy in terms of libido and other effects uh so i think i leave the questions at that and we leave it for further questions later on um after the third talk which we have so i'm going to um come back to you sunila later but we'll uh, have the third talk which is related uh, which is going to be delivered by susan and the subject of the discussion is associated medical disorders and sexual dysfunction may i request uh, susan to give her talk so thank you for this opportunity to talk about various medical disorders leading to female sexual dysfunction i think this is a really important issue um and i'd just like to add on to what sanella has been talking about before i continue is that i think we need to be aware that when we talk about postmenopausal women we also need to remember that postmenopausal women stay very healthy well into their eighth decade and our recent study of women up until the age of 80 showed that women aged 65 to 80 50% were having sexual function problems and one third were comp- complained of vaginal dryness during intercourse in the last month so i don't think i'd just like to highlight don't just think about your menopausal patients who are in their 50s and 60s you also need to think about women well beyond that age so what are the factors that contribute to female sexual dysfunction other than hormone changes well An important one that we shouldn't assume doesn't exist is lack of knowledge. Most people these days get their sexual function knowledge from movies and books. Don't assume that your patient actually understands anything about appropriate stimulation that the the partner is spending time with the female etc. And there also may be partner dysfunction that's contributing. So you have to ask about is the partner sexually viable is the is the male partner able to have um an erection is that a problem and do they actually understand what's involved in sexual activity one of the single most significant determinants of female sexual function is having a partner and in fact women with a partner experience more problems with sexual dysfunction than unpartnered women But then you also have to look within the sec- in the partnered women the issue of relationship discord and is there a separation of emotional intimacy as the couple has as aged as well Then there's the expectation have women had bad sexual experiences in the past and therefore they already have a negative expectation of the outcome so therefore they don't expect to enjoy sex So you ask need to ask women about what their past experiences have been. And particularly for women at midlife, it's the context. Do they feel they have sufficient privacy? If they have a young adult living in the house with them, they may be much less comfortable to be sexually active than perhaps when they had little children. Do they feel safe? um and what are their cultural and religious beliefs so in some cultures it's it's assumed for example in some chinese cultures it's assumed that once a woman goes through menopause she should no longer be sexually active so you need to understand the context very much we know that women who are more knowledgeable and more educated 
are more likely to have female sexual function because their expectations are higher. But we also need to find out from women if they've been subject to either current or past sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. Um, have they had medical trauma in terms to their, to their urogenital tract? We need to understand if some women feel ashamed of having sexual activity, um, anxious, fearful, what their body image is. So women often after menopause feel that they're no longer as attractive, droopy breasts, um, change in appearance, perhaps weight gain. And in the general issue of, of taking history, you need to understand gender identity and talk to women about that. And finally, what other factors? Are they taking medications that could contribute to their dysfunction? Antidepressants are the classic ones. I don't know um, in India what the usage is, but in Australia, 25% of women of, who are postmenopause are taking an antidepressant. Are they depressed? The contribution of other illnesses, um, difficulty in movement, if they've got arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, are they worried if they've got cardiovascular disease? fatigue, and I'm going to talk a bit more about urinary incontinence. So we do know that after surgical menopause, as opposed to natural menopause, women are much more likely to experience um, sexual desire disorder. So this is the issue again about removing ovaries in a postmenopausal woman. Um, even in the postmenopausal woman, it can contribute to desire disorder because of loss of the ovaries. What about obesity? Well, we know that there's what we call a bi-directional relationship between obesity and, se and, and sexual dysfunction too. Um, not being loved, not being wanted can contribute to a woman's loss of self-image and self-esteem and her obesity. But obesity um, certainly in, is associated with um, dysfunction, although data um, is not always conclusive. We know that Weight loss does appear to improve female um, function, sexual function um, in women who have been obese. One would believe that metabolic syndrome may contribute to female sexual dysfunction. So um, health issues associated with metabolic syndrome, but there really is not very much data and studies are needed to address this. Urinary incontinence is definitely associated with female sexual dysfunction in a number of studies. So women are scared that they're going to actually have an episode of incontinence while they're sexually active. So it's really important to ask postmenopausal women about this issue in the context of speaking to them about their concerns about their sexuality. Now, Treatment of breast cancer definitely is associated with sexual dysfunction. In a longitudinal study we did, 20% of women with breast cancer at diagnosis had sexual problems. Two years post-diagnosis, 80% of women with breast cancer had sexual problems. And 70% of partnered women who were breast cancer survivors had sexual function problems. And we found that the sexual function problems were specifically related to the use of aromatase inhibitors, which is not surprising. Um, we do know that women on aromatase inhibitors are much more likely to have severe vulvovaginal atrophy and dyspyunia. So breast cancer is a common problem of sexual problems. In addition, women who have had colorectal cancer, which is um, one of the most common cancers in women, um, have impaired sexual function. Um, we know that um, sexual dysfunction is associated with mental health issues, lowered vitality and reduced social functioning. And again, we know that although there's a bi-directional relationship between depression and sexual function, women with dysfunction are more likely to be depressed dissatisfied with their home life and dissatisfied with their relationships. Now diabetes is increasing globally. I know in, um, Indian, in the Indian subcontinent it's an increasing issue 
and there is strong evidence that both type 1 and type 2 diabetes are substantially increased, associated with an increased risk of female sexual dysfunction. In women with type 2 diabetes, intensive lifestyle interventions and weight reduction can improve sexual functioning. In women with type 1 diabetes who have arousal disorders, this is the one indication for a trial of PDE5 inhibitor therapy. And this may actually improve um, sexual arousal and the capacity to have an orgasm in women with type 1 diabetes. So again, this is a special group of women for whom a detailed medical history can be very informative and useful when talking about this female sexual function. What about SSRIs and SNRIs? These are the most commonly prescribed antidepressants for women in most countries. 56% of women treated with an SSRI or an SNRI will have female sexual problems. Um, these can be arousal disorders, desire disorders and anorgasmia. The price, precise mechanism is not clear. It is believed possibly to be the potentia potentiation of serotonin, possibly um, reduced dopaminergic activity, but we don't know exactly how, why this occurs. I'll just go back to that slide. And again, we have shown that testosterone therapy will improve sexual function in women on an SSRI or an SNRI. And we also know that loss of um, orgasmic capacity, um, arousal problems can be a reason for women to actually stop their SSRI. So you need to talk to women about this problem. I'd like to talk a bit about having the conversation. Many of us will have patients who will skirt around the problem and I believe it's important for us as doctors to start the conversation. If you're not used to taking a sexual history, simply saying, are you presently sexually active? If the answer is no, ask the woman, is this a concern to you? If the woman's not concerned, you don't need to go on. But if the woman is concerned, this has opened the door for the patient to speak to you about their concerns. Ask them if they're having any difficulties at this time or any sexual concerns. You can ask if they've had a change in their sexual interest. There are several ways you can open, open the opportunity for the woman to speak to you. Ask her if she's having difficulty with vaginal lubrication or discomfort with sexual activity or concerns about sexual well-being. As I said, you can't, it's not just about hormones. You've got to ask the woman about her current circumstances, about her partner's status, her partner's health. It's really important to ask about childhood sexual abuse as well as non-sexual abuse, emotional abuse. Um, is the woman getting adequate sexual stimulation, both contextually and physically? So is the partner actually caring about their emotional well-being, not just their physical sexual interaction? Um, health history, medications including contraception and drug use. And there is new data about to be released showing that um, contraceptive use may actually impair sexual function. I'm not going to talk to you who are mostly gynecologists about the medical examination, but certainly it is important to look at loss of sensitivity or um, sexual pain. Fatigue is a common problem and one of the common causes is thyroid function, dysfunction in this age group, but also look at iron insufficiency and undiagnosed diabetes. So fatigue may cause a woman simply not to be interested. She can't be bothered because she's just too tired. An androgen profile should only be measured if androgen therapy is, is being considered. And take a careful history of multiple partners and decide whether a woman needs to be assessed for um, sexually transmitted infections. If you are going to measure the androgens, um, the problem with measuring testosterone is that it is only useful if you've got quality um, assays for the testosterone. The measurement of SHBG and DHEA is robust, but there's no good 
there's no better asset than an um, else, um, mass spectrometry for testosterone. Radio NEO assays are generally not reliable. Having said that, there's no cutoff to diagnose androgen insufficiency in women. So you can't say, well, your testosterone level's X, therefore it's too high, you can't have androgen insufficiency because maybe it's actually low for that woman. Again, only measure androgens if you're going to consider treatment. So how should you manage women? Relationship counselling. Look for all the other factors I've talked about. Sexually counselling when indicated. But look for all the other health-related issues, particularly medications. Treat vulvovaginal atrophy with vaginal oestrogen. And androgen therapy where indicated. And I'll stop there. So thank you. Um, there's one question I wanted to check with you is that, uh, is there any role for sildenafil in women? As men use... Well, the only, um, well, the only situation in this, which is, this has been shown to be really effective is, well, there are two, two studies Different, sorry, there are two group, different groups of women that research has shown PDE5 and sildenafil to be effective or any of that group of drugs. And that's women with type 1 diabetes with arousal disorder and women on SSRIs or SNRIs with arousal disorder. It is not shown to be effective in other generally um, well women who just present with female sexual dysfunction. Mm -hmm. But any any uh, contraindications to its use in women? Do we the have same, to look the same contraindications, uh, such as well, the same contraindications you would have in men. Same as for men. The the same contraindications as in for men. So if you, yes. obviously you're not going to use sildenafil in a woman with you know severe cardiovascular disease, but Correct. the groups of women that are likely to benefit, as I said, are type one diabetics and women on SSRIs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the other question I had was that uh, I did I had read some article on uh, how bariatric surgery in various very obese women helps with sexual dysfunction. Of course, it's done for their metabolic effects, but it has a side benefit of helping with sexual dysfunction. How does that work? Well, studies have shown that it's studies have shown that treatment of obesity per se will improve sexual function. So mm -hmm. I would suspect with the bariatric that the bariatric surgery, the greatest impact would be on a woman's self-esteem and her her. Um, feeling about herself. I mean, no woman really feels very sexy if she doesn't like the way she looks. I mean, right. we all know that. And mm -hmm. if you lose a massive amount of weight, you're going to feel a lot better about yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's mainly because of self-esteem. There's no endocrine uh, reason why, uh, you know, uh, reducing the obesity helps. Uh, there's been no, in, in, certainly in postmenopausal women, there's no improvement in androgen production just because you've lost weight. So there's no evidence that it's, it's actually endocrine. I, okay. I would say it's within the brain. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. I think we'll open the discussion for both the speakers to, um, to some of the questions which I've received on the web. But I'll ask first the moderators of uh, there are some cities in India who have where the um, delegates have uh, you know sort of uh, got together and uh, we'll ask their moderators to put in their questions so may I ask uh, uh, I can see Ratnabali on the screen so Kolkata Ratnabali do you have any yeah, questions good for the speaker good afternoon. may Thank I you have so uh, Sumita and Susan both on the on the screen yeah. please yeah, I can so see all of all three of you, I and I can hear you. Are addressing the question to Ratnabali. Yeah. So, uh, question number one: You have mentioned about oxytocin being used uh, in these cases of uh, decreased libido. So, what will be the dose? How can it be used? We don't have any experience of it. To Suzanne. Sorry, you must. You ma I'm sorry if you misunderstood. 
Can you hear me? I'm sorry if you oh. misunderstood me. Oxytocin has Oxytocin not been shown to be of any benefit at all. It's not helpful at all. It has not been shown to benefit women. Okay. The second question is on the stem cell therapy. Uh, uh, how much we have pro pro progressed in that? And is, do you have any personal experience of it? The stem cell therapy. Stem cell Stem cell therapy. To, Not Botox. Stem cell stem therapy. Cell for, for, for the ovaries to improve ovarian function or to do what? I think she must be meaning for vaginal atrophy. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, I am not, I'm not aware of any studies of stem cell therapy for vaginal atrophy that I know of. Um, Sunila may know, but not that I know of. If we are talking about the testosterone therapy, when to start it and how long it can be used, is it oral that you prefer or uh, the dermal therapy or any pellets that can be used? Testosterone. Okay. All right. So with testosterone, number one, oral testosterone therapy is not used in men or women. Basically, testosterone is very, very poorly absorbed orally. There is one formulation that's an old one of Andriol, but the problem with that is the absorption is very erratic. So you cannot be confident that the woman is not getting overtreated. So it's not something we use. We use only transdermal testosterone therapy. In the past, we have also used pellets, but the pellets that were available and produced um, by Organon for decades are no longer made. So we use a transdermal cream. Um, the other option would be to, if you don't have that available, to use one of the male transdermal gels in a very very low dose, so a tenth, one tenth of what you would use for a man. And you have to monitor the blood levels very carefully. In terms of when to start using, we have done two studies showing that testosterone will improve libido of premenopausal women over the age of 35 who have um, low libido even though they've still got regular cycles because testosterone levels fall from the late 30s. So I will treat a woman in her late reproductive years with testosterone and there is no age at which I stop. I have women in their 70s still using testosterone. But the critical issue is you must always monitor the dose. So even if I have a patient who's been using testosterone for 5 or 10 years, I check their blood level every six months just to make sure they don't start using too much and they become androgenized. So it's really important to keep the levels in the normal female range. The next question is a bit clinical. There are some women who suffer from sleep disorders and there are women who after uh, coitus in the postmenopausal age gets excruciating headache and pain lower abdomen. So is there any evidence uh, of this treatment of this problem and what will be the management of these cases? Suzanne, please. Well, I must, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what um, Sunila would comment on this. I mean, I, I must say that um, post-coital pain, abdominal, low abdominal pain, I would, it, in a post-menopausal woman is something that I rarely see and I would be referring to a gynecologist. Um, the post-coital headache, again, is something I, in 35 years of clinical practice, I have never been referred a patient, an, a woman with a post-coital headache. Um, so I'm, I can't comment. What about your... Uh, someone else might be able to make a yeah. comment. Any comments, Duru? We can't hear you, Duru. We can't hear, Duru. Uh, 
probably just can you hear me nabli can you hear me we can't hear duru no no there is no connect can you please can you hear me ratnabali i am sunila here yeah i can hear you but we can't hear duru okay she saying something yeah she is trying to say something but we can't <laughs> get it properly no meanwhile i'll just share that uh, yes so i i, I can ask some questions uh, sunila there is a question for you and it says that in cases of hysterectomy along with bilateral salping oophorectomy uh, in a perimenopausal age when would you suggest to start the estrogen as soon uh, as uh, the operation is complete means within a 2 to 3 days or uh, after uh, some time when the symptom starts developing i guess you are talking about systemic estrogen therapy estrogen therapy yeah no estrogen therapy of course systemic estrogen therapy because the bsc yeah right yeah with local one so i think within next week of uh, within a week after getting the basic serum estradiol levels and uh, we need to know or in addition what was the reason for hysterectomy because the women those who have hysterectomy for the reasons of fibroids or endometriosis they do have still a good level of estrogen in their body so we need to have the pre hrt workup pre mst workup and if they are deficient and of course routinely also to prevent the immediate severe uh, menopausal problems in surgically menopausal women we can initiate following a week after the um, surgery thank you there is another question uh, susan as well as sunil anybody can answer that uh, we have discussed about vulvo vaginal atrophy and its treatment with estrogen discussed about testosterone and the gels in cases of an orgasmia what would be the management and uh, are there any specific oral medicines that can be used in these cases sir so for so for anorgasmia you need yeah, anorgasmia yeah. is the is the second most common sexual problem reported by women um it's very common and firstly you need to take a detailed history so you would there is a very large number of women who get to menopause who have never experienced an orgasm so if it's lifelong then it no hormones about to fix this it's about again understanding the woman's expectations a really detailed personal history about sexuality often the treatment is about sexual education and unraveling past bad experiences or concerns or ability to relax and often the first treatment is actually giving the woman permission to actually masturbate and experience an orgasm by by self expression so i think an orgasm requires a very detailed history if the woman says in the last 5 years since going through menopause this has changed i used to always have an orgasm now it's changed and i saw a patient a couple of patients like that yesterday treatment with testosterone can be highly effective testosterone increases vaginal blood flow um increases sensitivity of the clitoral and um vaginal tissues and testosterone alone um assuming you're treating any vulvo vaginal atrophy can be highly effective in some women who have normal desire arousal is good and it have isolated anorgasmia again sildenafil um can sometimes be useful i've i've found very few patients like that over the years and often again a very probing history is very important thank you very so much i'd like to add to that yeah uh, any experience uh, about the vaginal laser therapy how efficacious it is and how safe and who is going to treat it gynecologists have not started treating laser treatment 
So uh, how we are going to handle these patients uh, for vulvovaginal atrophy and dysfunction? The laser treatment. As I have already um, shown in the slides that the Arbium laser has come out as a very good second generation treatment for the uh, pelvic vaginal relaxation syndrome. And of course, uh, these are effective. And most of the urogynecologists, uh, they do it. And they have a Wellness study which have shown it is really effective. But of course, there is a major, uh, major um, question about and major hindrance about this particular treatment is that it is considered as cosmetic surgery. And since it is a little bit costly, so the uh, I think the um, authorities have to, since most of the uh, women, those who are having vulvovaginal atrophy, they do have at the older age. So I think the question of uh, reimbursements and the uh, insurance is much more important in this particular context. Although in Wallace's study and other studies, it has found very um, effective and recent upcoming uh, treatment. Suzanne, can I, just, can I add, yeah, of course, add of course. to that? I'm, I'm going to differ. I am very concerned that people are promoting this treatment with very little evidence to support effectiveness or safety. There have been insufficient clinical trials. There have been, I'm not aware of a single placebo controlled trial. Um, the data I have seen is really inadequate. The biologic plausibility as to why this should work is unclear. And I had a very long conversation with an eminent European urogynecologist a week ago who just shook his head and said, I just don't understand how this is being used for this reason. The, um, the lasers were, the DECA laser was approved in the US but not for vaginal laser therapy. And so I would suggest that we do need to take a deep breath and be a little bit more cautious and make sure we see clear evidence because this is one, one instance that's being driven by economics and money making and not necessarily by clinical data. So that's my opinion at the moment. I might be completely wrong and I might, it might show that there are some very good studies come out to show this in a placebo control study is highly effective. But I'm not aware of one study that's shown up. Okay, uh, about another well, question. Can on the local or comparative evaluation, but mainly for the pelvic floor relaxation, it has been done. And uh, so far, there is no comparable data. So uh, it is really the future research is warranted. And we, we, need, we are just waiting for its uh, efficacy in real, overall in relation to vaginal atrophy. Uh, Sunila, uh, what is your experience about the uh, gels containing visnadine, you know, uh, being used for uh, say some 10-15 minutes before, so uh, which increases the local sexual active, uh, sensitivity, and uh, how does it act, and is it really helpful? What is the content? Sorry, I could not hear. What is the content in the gel? Uh, Visnadine gel, Visnadine. One of them this is, is called. Is the trade name or what? What is the content? Pharmaceutical content. I I don't uh, know about the trade name of this particular gel. Not uh, Visnadine. Uh, the you know, trade names are different. Visna gel, Gomet gels. It contains Visnadine. I think these are all. Uh, I think these are all lubricants, and uh, the lubricants are short. Have the shorter duration. And they contain uh, the L-arginine. They contain local L-arginine, okay. which improves Hello. the blood flow. Okay. And uh, are uh, they really helpful? with used in 15 uh, minutes or half an hour before and uh, intercourse. Is it really helpful? I think all these things which are used during intercourse or before intercourse, they are mostly acting as lubricants. And uh, the basic thing is that one has to be cautious that what, what you are using and what is the actual content because as I've already said, they can be cytotoxic and there sometimes the glycol content of these basic um, 
lubricants are is are not sufficient and they may they may have candidal infection later on so and we don't have any like um, i mean so to my knowledge i think i don't have much of the experience also and much of the data on this uh, urethral carankle is one of our uh, you know findings we get many a time with the painful injuries and others so uh, how do you manage these urethral carankles actually if the woman comes with it i've got few questions uh, from my audience two three questions on urethral carankle so would you like Thank to can you can Thank you Sunila what do you like to answer Hello Hello uh, yeah, I can hear you we can Can you hear me Yeah 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 I'm really back I'm so sorry I was off track but I think we need to move on to another city since there are many others waiting to ask questions so if you don't mind Ratnabali if you have time later we'll come back to you but let's go off to Lucknow in the meantime we have got quite a few questions from Lucknow Uh, can we move the camera to lucknow please who's the moderator at lucknow when uh, we had some questions from lucknow uh, there's one question is uh, from dr saroj uh, she says what drug would you recommend for sexual dysfunction and depression together susan would you like to take that Well I think you it's that there's no one single answer for that because obviously depression can be a cause of sexual dysfunction so the first thing you need to do is treat the depression and then if indicated add in testosterone but I would not be advocating testosterone to treat depression so assess and treat the depression first Okay so I think we've got the answer treat the depression first and then take care of the um, dysfunction Uh, we'll go to uh, Patna as a city. Uh, Patna, yes, madam. Can we ask um, doctor to ask your questions from your city? Is it audible, madam? Yes, we can hear you. Good evening, Doro, and we are ready with few questions. Yes. Uh, from Patna, this is uh, addressed to Susan. How can you assess which woman? will be benefited by estrogen or androgen supplementation in improving sexual dysfunction in peri or menopausal women which one to choose estrogen or androgen so let's be really clear estrogen is used to treat vasomotor symptoms and other menopausal symptoms so symptoms of you know um mood change irritability um menopausal depression sleep deprivation hot flushes night sweats joint pain etc that's the role of estrogen estrogen should not be used to treat sexual dysfunction vaginal estrogen is for vaginal vulvo vaginal atrophy So that is another separate role. And then systemic testosterone is for low libido or desire arousal disorder. So they've got very separate roles and estrogen should not be given just for low libido low desire. Thank you madam. Okay. The second question to Dr. Sunila. What is the Sunila we being in the Indian context I'm asking you? on behalf of the audience what is the best vaginal lubricant which is available to us and should it be used just prior to intercourse or on a routine basis i think uh, the in terms of availability i think we have limited in our um, basket but still i think the few of the vaginal gels like ky jelly or maybe uh, right. yeah so uh, but the most important thing which i would suggest to the clinician is to look into the content the ph the osmolarity as we have discussed it should maintain the osmolarity and of course the contents so lubricants usually during uh, before or during act 
can be used and uh, of course in our setup i think the coconut oil jojoba oil and uh, all uh, uh, different otc preparations which are available they can they people are are using but we don't have any data and it's our clinical experience which will judge or advise or abandon them according to the requirement of the patient according to the availability and of course the experience what she has uh, passed through with these preparations so the oil based are uh, much less used but the water based are much better in terms of uh, ir irritation right thank you uh, another question uh, dr susan uh, do you think managing menopause in regards to the de decreased libido and improving sexual performances menopause treating menopause and andropause simultaneously would give better results because as in infertility they are always treating both the partners and if necessary but we must investigate likewise this word must be put i think investigating the uh, male partner as well and then we should uh, prescribe medicines do you agree with me um yes and no i so yes and no so i'll turn the question around If the man comes with erectile dysfunction, do you need to treat his wife? No, quite often. If the man comes into yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. No, I was just saying that so many times we find young women who have severe vaginismus, and uh, the husbands are fine, and after some time, uh, you know, they also develop erectile dysfunction, probably because they. wives don't let them come here then <laughs> that's true that's true but in general i think that we need to i i think it's really important to at times see couples and at times see the individual woman because women often won't tell you the whole truth and the whole story if their partner or their husband is sitting in the room they're not going to you know until you the woman's not going to say things that they think might be hurtful to their partner but which is the truth which they need to talk to you about but i also feel very i mean we i will live in a very different culture so we we have many women in our culture who are sexually active but not partnered even though they're in their 50s and 60s and 70s So I I think it's or they they're sexually active with someone other than their partner. So I I think it's I think we have to ask the woman if she's happy to involve the partner or not. I don't think we should insist on it. Right. But certainly a woman is going to have concerns if her partner has erectile dysfunction or health issues, which is what I did try to highlight. Thank you Susan. Now to Dr. Sunila. This is I want to begin regarding our Indian women. Indian women in general do not approach gynecologists for that matter any physician for declining sexual functions. Do you think we should it's high time for us to start sexual counseling as other counselings that we are doing like cancer etc and do you think it will improve apart from that sexual dysfunction the general lifestyle and overall health improvement uh this is a very rightly pointed out and as i have already uh, shared with you our indian menopause society research data that around 48% of the women they do suffer from sexual dysfunction but they don't discuss even the asian survey has also uh, agreed to uh, had reported the same so i think when we are running a menopause clinic and the women those who are coming with menopausal symptoms the symptom cluster as i have already said we have to identify if she is suffering from the symptom cluster related to urogenital problems directly we should go and ask and dig out her sexual problems and most of the problems will be correlated with that 
and it is a very important area for the healthcare professionals and of course to the women to come out and uh, that's that's how i think we can have a successful um, outcomes in relation to overall physical and psychological aspects of menopausal health thank you sunila and the last question uh, it's little witty how to how to manage a case of increased libido <laughs> Susan, did you get that question? Yeah, I did. So um, I think you have to. So there is there is an, a, a well documented clinical condition of persistent arousal disorder in women, and I have in fact looked after many of these patients, and it's very distressing to the patient. Um, that's a persistent vascular arousal problem and that's very different to increased libido. I think if a woman is experiencing heightened libido, we do need to investigate whether she developed a hormone abnormality that is driving this. And again, women who experience this unexpectedly are very distressed by it. So I think it needs to be dealt with in a very sensitive, caring manner and I think you need to do a full hormone workup to find out what's going on and what's changed for this woman and take it quite seriously. And I have seen several patients with this problem. One lady who was about 62 and she came to me and she was very, very disturbed saying that she's constantly thinking of men. She lost her husband and she was, she was constantly wanting to have sex. And when I went through her papers, I realized that she'd been on double dose of Tibolone, which somebody had put her on and never told her that she was on hormone therapy. And she had been happily taking it for the last 10, 15 years, I don't know how many. And she, she was very, very disturbed mentally because, uh, you know, it's something which really upset her. But this is where sometimes as clinicians, um, they medicate women, um, you know, sometimes when their symptoms are very high with two tablets of a similar drug and with not telling them that they need to come back for the checkup, not telling them what they are taking and the poor woman kept taking it and I think that's something we need to be very well aware of that when we offer any kind of hormone therapy, we need to counsel patients that they need to come for regular checkups, they need to you know, probably stop the drug at some point in time, etc. So I think we thank uh, Dr. Pramila Modi from Patna for moderating my this. Guru and Susan and Sunila yeah. can take one. Thank uh, you very much. We go to Jammu where Sudha Sharma is moderating the session and uh, Sudha may I request you to just put about three to four questions, not more. Um, I'm sorry I, I got delayed because my, my complete voice system here was down. So. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Duru, uh, for yeah, giving us an opportunity. Uh, my question is to Dr. Suzanne. Uh, though we know that uh, androgens, uh, they increase libido and uh, well-being, but still we do not have any testosterone which is dosed for females. And all the testosterone which you have talked, transdermal gels, are they being uh, dosed according to the female requirement, how to apply them and uh, how long will it take for their effect to come. And number two question to Dr. Suzanne only, what is your experience with vasodilatory? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, I think I dropped out for a minute. So the first question is, we are, in Australia, we are in a very privileged situation because we have a testosterone product that was specifically developed for treatment of women. And we have done several studies with this product we have looked at what we call a pharmacokinetic profile and we know that when we use it in women we get female blood levels of testosterone. So this is called Androfem and 
I have no shares in the company, but you can look at it on the internet. I know that they do export it internationally, and we've been using it for about 15 years or more to treat women. Um, the important thing is that when you treat women with a female appropriate dose, you do not get an immediate effect. So if you use an intramuscular injection of a high dose of testosterone, the woman will tell you that in the next few days, she has sexual thoughts, arousal, etc. But if you use a low-dose transdermal therapy, be it a patch or a gel or cream, at a female dose, you don't usually get the effect for about four to six weeks. So it's a slow onset effect. And, um, and then if a woman hasn't had a benefit by about six months, we just, it's clearly this is not a testosterone problem. Basidoxaphine is not available in Australia as yet. It was originally approved, um, it is approved but not available. It was originally approved for treatment of osteoporosis. It's never been marketed for that. It will soon be available in combination with conjugated estrogen um, and it's approved in the US and Europe and that's to treat menopausal symptoms but not as anything for sexual function, purely menopausal symptoms. Okay. Uh, another, another question, question is, is what, what is, is the, the treatment, treatment of vulval pruritus after excluding all the pathological things? Well, after excluding all the pathological things um, and all the gynecological things, there is actually a very large subset of women who have... Um, either vulval or perianal or perineal pruritus where it's actually stress. And um, I worked many years with a dermatologist and in fact, I used to just say it was ridiculous, but really this dermatologist had huge benefit by using a very low dose, like one milligram of diazepam nocte to treat this because a lot of women, it's perianal and as I said, perianal, perineal, vulval itching and irritation can sometimes be a purely stress response, but you've got to exclude all the pathology first. Thank you, Dr. Susan. Susan, thank you so much. Uh, we'll go to Jaipur where Anju Soni is moderating the session and where Sunita is also uh, speaking from. So Dr. Anju? Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Dhuru. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Well, I am uh, with us. We have Dr. Pradeep Sharma. He is professor and head of psychiatry at SMS Medical College. Before coming to the question, I like to share his views on some things which he has uh, said. Somebody was asking for, uh, for this question from Lucknow that uh, is there a uh, antidepressants which will not affect the uh, sexual function? He says that there is a mirtazapine salt which is not SSRI or SNRI that can be given and it does not affect the sexual dysfunction. Uh, Dr. Susan, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Um, so, mirtazapine is, can potentially not have those effects, but mirtazapine is, as we know, is associated with weight gain, particularly. It's not, it's not a very favoured, um, antidepressants in Australia. The one that the ones that are used most to minimise effects on sexual function that we have available are valdoxin and um, in the US they use bupropion. But we we, we, we don't use mirtazapine. I mean I hardly see anyone on mirtazapine. He says he has a lot of experience so I don't know whether uh, it's effective or not. Apart, and his another question is, apart from sex hormones, are there any other hormones like thyroid hormone which may affect the sexual function? No. And, and we, we did a, this was part of the um, International Sex, Society of Sexual Medicine consensus program to look at all hormones. And no, thyroid hormone has no involvement on sexual function. So 
it really is sex steroids with a bit of a cloud over oxytocin because there's no data there and um, maybe in the future we'll find oxytocin is useful but at the moment there is no data to suggest any benefit. Are there any statistics to show the difference between psychogenic and non-psychogenic causes female uh, sexual dysfunction? Well, I think so. My there. question is, any statistics to show the difference between psychogenic and non-psychogenic causes of female sexual dysfunctions? Well, I don't think we know. Um, I, I don't know how you separate it out. What I mean, desire is is low desire can often be secondary to dyspyunia. If it hurts, you don't want to do it, and then you just get fixed that you don't want to do it. I think trying to get arbitrary lines between what's psychogenic and what's what's biological or physical is very difficult because the margins get very blurred. And the other thing is that mo women can move between groupings. Women might have um, for a period of time low desire and then it might become more of an arousal problem because of other factors. So we don't have statistics because again, if it doesn't work, if a woman's anorgasmic or if it hurts, you don't want to do it. So how do you separate it out? Uh, uh, what do you think about a team approach if needed? Uh, if a patient is having these problems like uh, role of psychiatrist, marriage counselor, counselor, gynecologist or a sex therapist? I'm sorry? Uh, what, what do you think about a team approach? Is it needed? Uh, where a psychiatrist, a gynecologist, or a marriage counselor, or a sex therapist involved? Is there any role of a team approach? Well, I think that in most settings, a team approach is a financial luxury. Most of us have, um, have health systems that are completely overloaded. But I think that um, there are some instant, like I share a lot of patients with psychiatrists and gynecologists, but I don't believe every single patient needs a sex therapist and a counselor and a and a gynecologist. I mean, I think we need to triage. Some patients, some patients. Some patients are complicated, and I think they need a team approach. And that's when the doctors need to talk to each other. But many instances are quite straightforward. Uh, we have doc uh, another uh, question from yeah. us. Dr. Anju, uh, may I request that we go to the next city because uh, Dr. Susan has to leave in some time. So we need to uh, request Dr. Ambuja to ask uh, uh, two or three questions. Thank one you. More, so one, more, can, one more question only. <laughs> Susan, <laughs> can you wait for 10 minutes more? I can't stay for 10 minutes more, no. I'm, I'm, I do have to leave. Okay, uh, five minutes. And then I've got to go. Can we use table on? Table on is very effective, but it is not, it's a very weak androgen. And many women with, with, um, with androgen insufficiency causing their sexual function will not respond to tibolone. It is not, it's not a replacement for testosterone. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Ambuja in Hyderabad, please. One question, Dr. Ambuja. Thank you, yes. Dr. Can we use DHEA cream for okay. sexual function? So, systemic DHEA's capsules and tablets are completely clinically ineffective for the treatment of female sexual dysfunction. This has been shown in consistently in two big systematic, independent systematic reviews. Vaginal DHEA has been shown to have some benefits if used every single day for vulvovaginal atrophy. It's only ever been studied by one group and I would think that we need to see confirmation of this data by other groups. I don't think women are going to be happy to use a vaginal cream on a daily basis for vaginal atrophy and that's one of the biggest limitations. So no, I do not recommend DHEA in any systemic form for treatment of basically anything. Oral DHEA is not approved by FDA. What is your experience regarding that? 
we did a randomized controlled trial of over 100 women with, um, with a DHEA um, cream that, got, got, that resulted in very good drug alert. Sorry, we used oral DHEA and found no benefit in that study of over 100 women. So oral DHEA is not beneficial to women not for sexual function, not for menopausal symptoms, not for cognition, not for lipids, not for insulin resistance, not for anything. Thank you very much. Last question to Dr. Sunila. Uh, vaginal estrogen for vaginal atrophy when we are using, how long we can use? Because some people from 50 years onwards, they use it for a few years and they would like to use it like continuously. Do you advise them to use for many more years? Very important, Dr. Ambujia, because most of the women, most of the studies so far has been done for till one year only. So uh, usually we uh, don't advocate these women to use continuously for more than one year because we don't have data to know the safety profile for more than one year. But still I would say these women, they can just have holiday free days and then again they can restart, but it under close supervision. That is very, very important to have close supervision and uh, the measurement of the levels also. Of course, because there is, systemic, uh, they, there is no systemic uh, effect of the uh, local estrogen which is appreciated, but it's still uh, for the safety profile, one cannot ask the women to use for lifelong without supervision. So one year continuously safe. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Sun. And thank you very much all the moderators of the International Menopause Society. Thanks the speakers for their time and expertise, the moderators, the delegates on the web who have actively participated, and Pfizer for an unrestricted educational grant. We welcome your suggestions and please write to us uh, at any of these uh, email IDs if you have any suggestions on how we can make our webinars better. And uh, on behalf of the International Menopause Society. I thank all of you for being here with us. Thank you so much, Susan, for holding on. Thank you. I know you're, you're uh, entertaining guests at home, so please go ahead and get everything ready. <laughs> thank you, uh, okay, Leela. Thank you so much, and thank you, everybody in the audience. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Guru, for this great initiative and involving us, giving us opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello.